morning, everyone. So nice to see all of you here tonight. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy what we have in store for you. I'm John Henry. I'm the director here, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the FIA and to the first presentation of um, the Camaretti Family Lecture Series, which is established by Jay, well, you know, Jay and, Jay and Prasad, of course. We can applaud now. This lecture series intends to focus on topics of art, history, and culture of South Asia. And um, I think it's long overdue. Uh, we, you know, we operate a, a gallery that's devoted to Asian art. And, um, you know, we just don't teach it enough in our schools. And so many people are just completely in the dark when they walk in those galleries. And hopefully we're kind of opening a door a little bit, but through a lecture series like this, I think we're really starting a new chapter for us. And again, thank you very much, Jay and, and Prasad. Uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. Siddhartha Shah, uh, and his presentation will be titled, Our Tryst with Destiny, Love, Loss, and Liberation in Indian Art. Uh, but before I bring Dr. Shaw to the stage, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, who makes so many things possible here. Also, the citizens of Genesee County for the Genesee County Arts, Education, and Cultural Enrichment Millage, which provides free entry to the museum every day for all citizens of the county. Take a moment, please. Yes, well, thank you, yes. That applause is for a lot of you, and the vote will come again, so keep that in mind. Um, join me in silencing things like this that you might have with you, please. Dr. Siddhartha Shaw earned his PhD in art history from Columbia University and is the director of education and civic engagement and curator of South Asian art at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, which is home to the largest and most important collection of modern Indian art outside of the subcontinent. Let's please give a warm welcome to Dr. Siddhartha Shaw. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Just going to get myself set up. So my sincere thanks to John for that generous introduction, and to Tracy Glab, Lori Motley, Heather Jackson, and all the members of your staff who've helped me prepare for tonight, and also to the members of your board and the community who have welcomed me with such kindness. My thanks also to the Komoredi family for sponsoring this lecture and for inviting me to inaugurate this series, which will bring to your community some of the most brilliant minds and talented speakers in the field of Indian art. Um, I currently have two roles at the Peabody Essex Museum and only about 20% of that focuses on South Asia at this point, so I'm actually delighted to be able to visit this subject that is so dear to my heart um, with all of you today. Um, in preparing for this talk over the past several months, I very much wanted to present something that would be meaningful or of use to you all. It's challenging enough to have to introduce the entire history of Indian art in such a short talk, but even more so when your aim is to be relevant to an audience and in a city that you know nothing about. Having never been to Flint before, I opted for this particular narrative arc which I see as having been inspired by the little that I do know about your city and your community's more distant and recent past, your own tryst with destiny, and always with an eye fixed one pointedly on a very bright future ahead. I recall feeling great anticipation and excitement as we approached the 100th birthday of the Statue of Liberty. 
As a child, I poured over the July 1986 issue of National Geographic with photographs of her old and new torches and dreamed of seeing her in real life one day. To me, she was like the goddess of America, dressed in a green sari, holding symbolic implements in her hands, not unlike the Hindu gods and goddesses we had around our home in Illinois. I was utterly fascinated by this symbol of America, a beacon for immigrants, like my parents, with her message of hope and promise of freedom. I also remember asking myself, so if she represents the United States, what symbolizes India? And this came to mind, the Taj Mahal, commissioned by the Emperor Shah Jahan as a mausoleum for his wife who died in childbirth. These two monuments convey very different messages. One, to quote Emma Lazarus, is the mother of exiles, who calls to her the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to be free. The other is a crowning jewel atop two broken hearts. In the words of Rabindranath Tagore, a teardrop on the cheek of time. The difference between a symbol of hope and one of heartbreak is striking. In my early 20s, I emptied so many pens and burned through so many journals, recounting my own feelings of heartbreak and fears of being unlovable. I know now that I'm not the only one who has ever felt this way, but at that time, and in particularly vulnerable moments, I sort of felt bombarded by all of the heartbreak uh, and stories of unrequited love that seemed to pervade Indian culture. As someone who's bicultural, I had to negotiate between one culture where unfulfilled love reigned supreme and another that pummeled me with fantasies of happily ever after. I find there's tremendous affection for romantic tragedy in India. And I'll start with some of the films I remember seeing just to set the tone. The legendary Mughal e Azam tells the story of Prince Salim's love for a commoner, Anarkali. The prince's father does not approve, and ultimately the young woman is sentenced to death in a most spectacularly cruel way. She is to be built into a wall. Though she escapes, the two never meet again. Or my personal favorite, Umrao Jan, starring the incomparable Bollywood beauty Rekha. A young girl is kidnapped and sold to a brothel where the madam trains her in the arts of dance and seduction. She falls for a handsome and wealthy man, but he marries someone else. The film ends with her looking at her reflection in a mirror, reflecting on a heart that has been broken again and again and again. And I will just leave this here for you to take note of for the future. A novel from 1917 that has thrice been remade. This is romantic tragedy of the most epic proportions, and I highly recommend it. But unrequited love is so present in our mythology, too. The 12th century poet Jayadev described the relationship of Krishna and Radha in graphic detail in his Gita Govinda, detailing their mutual affection, Krishna straying from her in his eventual return, all as a metaphor for the circuitous path of one who seeks union with the divine. But Radha ends up marrying someone else, and so does he. And the relationship between Lord Rama and his consort Sita, that doesn't end very well either. <laughs> Though images like this suggest otherwise, there is certainly no happily ever after over here. I have since learned to find great beauty and wisdom in the many meanings of heartbreak in Indian culture. And it is what compels me tonight to frame one story of Indian art in the context of love and loss, of pleasure and pain, and the liberation that can come in their transcendence. Not just love as an experience of pleasure and heartbreak as one of pain, but how the most beautiful and the most painful experiences that we endure as individuals or as a collective experience, they can incite us to hold even more depth of feeling and even greater possibility for the future. How the heart doesn't just break, but how love and loss cause the heart to break open. So in our relatively short time together, 
I will share with you how love and sensuality have been visualized in Indian art, how loss and hardship likewise take form, and finally, how liberation expresses itself in the art of post-independence India. By taking you through one of the galleries I curated at the Peabody Essex Museum, as you will see, I have sought to frame spiritual liberation as a transcendence of pleasure and pain, but the liberation of India from colonial rule as an ongoing struggle between love and loss, desire and anguish. So much of Indian culture is about intentional and sometimes very intense sensory engagement. And the eyes are certainly stimulated by all there is to take in. As Diana Eck writes in her brilliant book on seeing the divine image, quote, in India, seeing is a kind of touching, end quote. And there is no denying the pervasive sensuality of the sculpted human and divine figures that populate many of India's sacred structures. Ekphrastic descriptions in Sanskrit literature and sacred text are filled with metaphors that articulate the voluptuous female body's connection to fertility. The sensuous body is one that is bursting with life, replete with organic forms that conjure visions of the growing natural world. Thighs are compared to banana trees or an elephant's trunk, arms to young stalks of bamboo. Breasts are like weighty pots that rub against each other rhythmically. Eyes are likened to lotus petals or carp, and eyebrows are gently curved like a rainbow. We find figures like these at some of the earliest Buddha stupas in India. Flamboyant and free, they're almost flirtatious in their gestures and confident stance. Each of the women has a distinctly hourglass figure and wears an elaborate belt that draws attention to her wide hips and thick legs. Their bodies are strong and their breasts smooth and well-oiled from centuries of being touched. Let's take a closer look. Their perfectly shaped brows form an archer's bow. Their eyes seem to smile, affirmed by the soft upward curve of the lips. Heavy earplugs accentuate their rounded cheeks and their ample breasts protrude both outward and inward above a slender waist. They are sacred in their sensuality, like figurative landscapes that recall the lush fecundity of the earth. But of course, one wonders, what are these sumptuous women doing on a Buddhist structure? Well, we presume a few things. For one, their bodies are auspicious, expressions of all that is bountiful, beautiful, healthy, and well. They embody a love for pleasure, which, explains, uh, which likely explains their appearance on the stupa's exterior, like the women who attempted to seduce the Buddha before his awakening. They signify a realm of worldly pleasure in contrast to the peace that awaits once we enter the world of the Buddha. Here, sensuality and spirituality exist in harmony with each other. They are at home with one another, in relationship. But let's also consider how sensuality expresses itself in the male form. In Greco-Roman sculpture, we see a resounding emphasis on an idealized body where every muscle appears flexed and defined. The ideal male body in Indian art appears in stark contrast, where tone and flexion assume a very different form. The god Shiva, in his manifestation as Nataraj, lord of dance, embodies a supernatural elegance and grace. Even as his dreadlocks shoot wildly in every direction, his strength isn't conveyed through swollen biceps but rather the ease with which he holds his arms aloft. The bend of his knees requires engagement of his thighs mus muscles, which are more like the solid thighs of a ballet dancer than those of a bodybuilder. His shoulders are wide and smooth, his chest is strong, his body is supple and pliant. Shiva's strength is conveyed not through tightness and tension, as in the famed Laokuan, who likewise twists and turns but rather through the effortlessness with which he holds himself as if mid-pirouette. He is, in fact, so at ease in this challenging posture 
that he even offers us a gentle smile. In Indian art, suppleness and grace are enviable traits among both men and women, which has led many in the West to misgender the Indian male body and refer to male figures by she and her. Certainly, the general absence of visible male genitalia has contributed to and perpetuated this misreading, but so has the abundance of jewelry that men wear. But I cannot overemphasize this enough, and if there's just one thing you take away from this presentation, let it be this. In the Indian context, the ideal body is always the body adorned, be it male, female, or zoomorphic. Flowers, fragrances, and jewels are not simply accessories to be added or omitted at will. Ornament may be superficial in that it is on the surface, but in India it is emphatically substantive, fulfilling various social and symbolic functions. Adornment, specifically jewelry, is what completes the auspicious body, and without it, one is simply incomplete. In the countless representations of intimate couples, we find bodies that are far from undressed, but rather fully adorned for the right of making love. And I know of no other religious art that so generously employs sensuality as that of Hinduism, where it serves as a metaphor for divine union. Lord Shiva and his consort Parvati are often visualized in this tender state where she sits on his lap. He reaches behind her to cup her left breast, while with his right hand he gently guides her face towards his to meet his adoring gaze. Lord Vishnu pulls a similar move with his consort Lakshmi to convey their deep comfort and affection for one another. This is divine love expressed in the most human terms of physical affection. We don't see here a separation between sexuality and spirituality. Rather, we see expressions of love through the body and its senses. These images reveal what I can only refer to as that distinctly Indian impulse to adore and to adorn. And though it would take a whole separate series of lectures to unfold the complexities of Tantra, I'll say in brief that this approach to spirituality is one in diametric opposition to orthodoxy, uh, which might call for the renunciation of sensual pleasures. Rather, Tantra encourages their integration or assimilation into spiritual practice. It is to work with desire and pleasure without becoming dependent on them, just as it is spiritual practice that works not just with light and joy, but also with darkness and the shadow. Indeed, like all things, there is a shadow to love and desire, a darker side. When I was growing up, the word tantra or tantric was synonymous with black magic, something spectral and sinister. As we all know, there is no love without loss, and the most transformative experiences of loss evince the profundity of our love. That they are two sides of the same coin is visualized in Christian imagery through representations of the virgin's love for her child and his ultimate crucifixion. Whether it is as individuals, as members of a community, and sometimes even as a nation, we must all pass through what St. John of the Cross referred to as the dark night, or the dark night of the soul. The sensuous in India is matched only by the potent representations of darkness and loss, often but not exclusively in the form of a goddess. The Devi Mahatmyam, or the glory of the goddess, is a text that emerged in the fifth or sixth century that recounts how the protective mother goddess Durga triumphed over the shape-shifting titan Mahishasur. It is during a particular clash that the most fearsome goddess Chamunda emerges out of her, described as frightful of countenance and armed with sword and noose, bearing a strange skull-topped staff adorned with a garland of skulls and clad in a tiger's skin. Her emaciated flesh appalling her mouth gaping, 
her lolling tongue horrifying, her sunken eyes glowing red. She descends on her enemies and flings them all into her mouth, elephants with their riders, chariots with their charioteers. They all are tossed into her mouth, and she grinds them furiously between her teeth. An impressive 8th century stone image of Chamunda from Orissa shows the goddess seated on the back of a corpse with a skull cup full of blood at the level of her heart and a freshly severed head in her lower left hand. A garland of dried human skulls is strung around her neck and her breasts, unlike those of the auspicious women we saw earlier, are sheaths of flesh that hang over her ribs. Her hair shoots up from her head like flames, bound with a serpent and adorned with a skull. With a rolled tongue and furrowed brow, she seems to release a maniacal shrill. Just imagine the blood-curdling sound that she makes. Chamunda is said to preside over epidemics, pestilent diseases, famines, and other disasters. And the great wisdom goddess Dumavati, the widow, rules over poverty, misfortune, and despair. She wears a dirty white sari and holds an empty winnowing basket in her trembling hands. Her eyes are sunken deep into her gaunt face. Her hair is dry and disheveled, devoid of both color and luster. She is quarrelsome and sits in a crow-topped chariot that's going nowhere. Earlier, we explored the confluence of sensuality and spirituality in Indian art. But here we might wonder, what could possibly be sacred about hardship and loss? Why would disaster and misfortune take the form of a deity? Here, too, there are multiple avenues for thinking through this. I'm reminded of an expression my mother told me as a child. The hand that feeds you is the same one that disciplines or slaps, a reference to the complexity of maternal love, which is sometimes quite wrathful. These goddesses have the ability to bestow suffering as well as to take it away. Dumavati, for example, is the grantor of all wishes and rewards, though her appearance exhibits quite the opposite. And when speaking about the goddess Kali, I often use this example to ease people's discomfort with her and help them understand her particular energy. Imagine you're walking in the woods and you happen upon a baby bear. It might look cute and cuddly, but you are potentially very much in danger because it means the great mother bear is likely nearby and she will tear you to pieces to protect her cub. Kali, and the other wrathful goddesses do not necessarily appear fearsome in order to scare us. They are protectors who must appear more evil than evil itself. We are invited not to run from her, but to learn to love even that which causes fear and pain. They too, like the images that embody love and desire, are expressions of the reality of life, loss, and love are essential parts of the human condition and the human experience. Spiritual traditions speak of our natural impulse to move towards pleasure and to run from pain as a cycle that holds the mind and spirit hostage lifetime after lifetime. And liberation in spiritual terms means to get off of this wheel to relinquish our attachment to pleasure, as well as our resistance to suffering. And while spiritual liberation is a transcendence of pleasure and pain, uh, one could think of it as a kind of equanimity. The liberation of India from colonial rule is something quite different. It is perhaps more accurately equal parts pleasure and pain. There is victory, yes, but there is also great loss. We tend to think of a nation's independence as a moment of celebration. But in doing so, we often neglect that it generally comes after a long and exhausting struggle, after a very difficult, collective, dark night of the soul. 
And it wasn't until 1947, after nearly 350 years of British occupation, that India broke free to stand on its own. But the birth of modern India was a very bloody birth. One which then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru referred to in almost romantic terms by referring to the traumatic moment of Indian liberation as a tryst with destiny. A statesman named Cyril Radcliffe, who had never been further east than Paris, France, was brought in by the British government to draw the borders that would separate the Islamic dominions of Pakistan, today Pakistan and Bangladesh, from the secular democracy of India. The lines he drew resulted in the largest mass migration in human history. An estimated 20 million people uprooted their lives in an effort to be on the right side of the line. And it is believed that around 10 million were killed in the devastating violence that erupted in its wake. So the liberation of India was by no means a transcendence of pleasure and pain or of love and loss. It was a thorny and gruesome conflation of the two. In one of his most celebrated poems from 1910, Rabindranath Tagore pleads to the divine, let my country awake. India finally had its moment in 1947 but to what was India awakening? We know quite well that there is no happily ever after. So then what does liberation mean or look like? What comes after liberation? It was with these questions and concerns in mind that I approached my first curatorial task at the Peabody Essex Museum to reimagine and reinstall the Chester and Davida Hurwitz collection the largest and most important collection of modern Indian art outside the subcontinent. With an effort to maintain a balance between victory and struggle and the realities of a largely unfulfilled dream that at times resembles the struggles and dreams of our own country here. Again, liberation, not as a transcendence of hope and despair, but somehow ricocheting between the two. So to demonstrate this, I'm now shifting somewhat abruptly to our current moment and to the Hurwitz Gallery, where I have framed the story of post-independence as one of liberation that pulls equally from love and from loss. Chester and Davy Hurwitz were from Worcester, Massachusetts, and first encountered Indian art in the early 1970s at a gallery in Paris that was exhibiting Makbul Fida Hussein's series of paintings based on the Mahabharata, the longest epic in human history. It's at about 1.8 million words, or 15 times the length of the Bible. The epic has as its climax a battle between cousins, men all born of the same blood, who turn on each other. As such, it made for an ideal metaphor to express or explore the challenges that beset the Indian subcontinent, particularly since its division. The Hurwitz has acquired 11 of the 29 paintings and committed to going to India the following year to meet the artist. This led to a lifelong friendship with Hussein and an insatiable appetite for modern Indian art that lasted nearly 30 years. Five of these Mahabharata paintings form the heart of the Chester and Davida Hurwitz Gallery to ground the complexities of post-independence India and give new expression to the amorous idea of pain in separation. Visitors find themselves encircled by Hussein's massive canvases as if surrounded by the battle on all sides. The design and display of these works is inspired by one of my favorite moments in the epic, the death of Arjuna's son Abhimanyu, where he finds himself at the center of a kind of labyrinth on the battlefield, able to enter, but ultimately not able to get out. And though there is indeed a way to exit this portion of the Hurwitz Gallery, one has the impression that the battle is taking place on all sides, unsure of how you ended up there, and somehow not able to part from the works very easily. 
While some have written and spoken about this series' as connection to the events of 1947, it is clear that Hussein was responding also to the tragic and tumultuous events at the time that he painted these works, in 1971. The unhealed wound of partition is violently reopened with the war of 1971 and a second partition on the Eastern Front. War, the migration of another eight to 10 million people, an estimated three million civilians are killed as countrymen once again turn on each other and the land is ripped asunder. East Pakistan is dissolved and Bangladesh is born. Dividing lines and broken circles all speak simultaneously of a violent mythic past and a palpable present. Ganga Jamuna makes clear that Hussein is not just referring to the goddesses that he represents here, nor is this simply a reference to 1947. The fractured red disc against that rich green field conspicuously resembles the Bangladeshi flag making clear that Hussein was engaging with the tensions of the time. Again, out of tremendous struggle comes liberation, renewed hope in the wake of tragedy, and another uncertain future. What immediately follows the Mahabharata are works that project an energy of aspiration and collective efforts to fulfill an unfulfilled dream. There is a gentle hustle and bustle to Patwardhan's town, people carrying on with their lives in harmony and building a future for themselves, and in that process, building a new nation. The painting conveys a tender optimism, but as we have seen, we must attend also to the shadow. That this desire to build and grow has had immense consequences on the environment. And as we can continue to construct and manufacture, our cities and towns don't necessarily become more welcoming or more habitable. In fact, they often become increasingly lonely and cold. And one of the things that India and the United States share in common, aside from both being cousins as former British colonies, is that the diversity of its people is part of what makes each country so unique and special. With all of our languages, religions, cultures, and cuisines, India is so rich in its complexity. And we see in the works of many artists great pride in their cultures and regions of origin, like these two masters of Telangana, K. Lakshmagaud and Thotavai Kuntam, who celebrate village life and the earthy women of their region. And yet, if we look closely, we sense both an air of the maternal and the melancholic. We see a fine balance betwixt and between sensuality and sorrow. But while diversity is one of the things that makes India so unique, it is also, like in our own country, what challenges the dream of a harmonious and truly unified nation. In reinstalling and reinterpreting this collection, it was critical that we create space to acknowledge the ongoing conflicts and consequences of partition or liberation that plague the subcontinent. Communities turning on each other, often in the name of religion. Violent ruptures in cities across the country. In passages from a criminal's dream, too, Nalini Malani pulls inspiration from one of the most grisly moments in the Mahabharata when the wife of the Pandavas, Draupadi, washes her hair in the blood of a man who had dishonored her. Draupadi, a virtuous and devout woman who is on the side of the righteous, even she has a shadow and a heart that burns with vengeance and rage at times. And across from this painting, there is, there is another that shows that the hardships faced by India's people relate to more than just religious or communal differences. Ram Kumar's moving unemployed graduates from 1956 shows four men with wide eyes that convey anxiety mixed with fear and who clearly carry a weight on their overburdened shoulders. In the years and decades following independence, there was an abundance of educated people in the country, but not enough jobs, forcing many to seek opportunities elsewhere in order to provide for themselves 
and their dependents. But the first time I saw this painting, it reminded me of a photograph my, of, my father shared with me of himself with several classmates, young men wearing ties with their entire lives ahead of them. When my father first showed me this photo, he pointed to each individual and told me where he had ended up. My father, the one with the tie tucked into the sensible belt, <laughs> um, went to New York in 1968, another to England, another to Canada, another to Scotland. It was only in viewing and reflecting on this painting that I touched something of that incredible risk that my father and so many others took to leave their families, cultures, and countries behind. It's as if he and others like him chose to part from home and their loved ones out of love for family and a sense of duty. Loss in the name of love. I'll also share here that in my other role at PEM as the Director of Education and Civic Engagement, um, I've worked on building partnerships with different organizations, and this includes a process with new nurses and new residents at our local hospital, where we engage in a practice around observation and communication. So just as art historians might have a language for art, and the general public might not, that medical professionals have a language for describing what's going on in the body, but that patients might not, and we worked with this painting. And um, in looking at this painting, one of the groups said, those are the eyes of the patients I was tending to in the COVID ward in the early days of the pandemic. That they, they were terrified. They didn't know what was happening. The other group said, those are the eyes of my colleagues who've been working all night, where all we could do was see their eyes and their exhaustion and their fear. What I find so moving about this story is that it demonstrates how the public can see their own lives and experiences reflected back at them through objects from cultures completely different from their own. A moment of welcome rest and contemplation follows these images of struggle. The lighting gets darker and the works have more room to breathe, a deliberate contrast to the cacophony of paintings just before. This moment of rest is intended as a kind of meditation on abstraction, an opportunity to let the experience settle, to engage in slower and closer looking. Two paintings by Gulam Rasul Santosh are placed side by side, and guests are invited to question and probe their associations with the colors black and white. rather than the usual associations of white as being positive and black being negative. Can darkness, can the shadow feel expansive? Can white or light be so bright that it constricts your vision? Can our relationship with the darkness and the light be reflexive? In preparing tonight's talk, I realized just how closely this gallery exercise gestures to our subject at hand. The gallery concludes with figurative works honoring revolutionary women as artists and as subjects. In the wake of independence, artists portrayed, uh, portrayed the female subject not just as goddess, consort, or mother, but as a central figure with her own rich inner life. Hussein's portrait of the late Fulan Devi, it's the painting on your left, popularly known as Bandit Queen, shows the heroine in her characteristic red bandana and a rifle in her hand. After a gang of men repeatedly raped her, Devi joined a team of bandits and killed over 20 of her attackers. She was later elected to parliament, also converted to Buddhism, and became an outspoken advocate for the poor until her assassination in 2001. She remains a powerful symbol for survivors of sexual assault and the disenfranchised across the country. And beside her is this painting by Rekha Rodwitia, The Glorious, The Shedding of Innocence, where we do see a nude who in a way embodies love, loss, and liberation all in one. She sheds her past like an old skin, as if emerging out from under a cloak of dreams and visions. She awakens into herself, renewed, 
and empowered to choose for herself who she will become. Looming over the gallery in conclusion is Hussein's massive Mahabharata from 1990. Like an imposing coda, it reminds us of the cyclical nature of all things. As we close right where we began, with the multivalent battle between the righteous and the wicked that reveals light and shadow on both sides. Victory or liberation does not in this case mean freedom from suffering. It means to persevere in spite of a broken and bleeding heart. It is said that one of the magical traits of the Mahabharata, and specifically of the Bhagavad Gita which it contains, is that its message is always relevant, anywhere and at any moment in time. The epic's lessons are about duty and perseverance, which connect quite nicely to our themes tonight of love and loss. One sense of duty to what you love deeply, and the perseverance or resilience to tolerate loss and hardship. The message, to me at least, is to hold tightly to hope and to trust that after the breakdown comes breakthrough. I try to live by these words and to remember them, to stand on the bones of breakdown until you reach breakthrough. Earlier, I shared how confused and frustrated I once was by the prevalence of unrequited love in Indian art and culture and how challenging it was to hold this alongside the promise of happily ever after. But the art of India that we have seen, if we look deeply enough, conveys something very different that visualizes both aspects of the human condition. Joy and love happen, yes. Loss and tragedy happen, yes, that too. My wish for us all for myself, my partner, my family, and for all of you and the community here at the FIA and in Flint, is that we learn to work with the love we feel, the losses we have experienced, and that we hold both with equal care and attention as we continue saying yes to what lies ahead. Liberation, yes, that too. Thank you. <laughs>